In this episode, I'm going to walk you through the Rails initialization process and determine what exactly is happening behind the scenes when you start up a Rails server. And through this, we will also get a better understanding of how engines and rail ties work. So let's dive right in. Now I will be walking through the Rails source code here, so we first need to grab a copy of it. I'll just copy this git URL here, and then git clone that URL to grab a copy of the repo. And then once that git clone is done, we'll just cd into there, and then we can git check out the version of Rails that we want to focus on. In this case, I want to focus on uh, version 3.1.1. So that checks out that specific tag. And I want to focus exclusively on the rail ties lib directory here because that's where all the initialization goodies happen. And now notice that even though this is in a rail ties directory, the lib folder here is called rails. So if you ever see something prefixed with the rails path or inside of a rails module, the source code for that is likely located here in rail ties. So now that we have a copy of the source code, let's first take a look at the Rails command because this command is pretty interesting. It's sort of a, a split personality because it behaves very differently depending on whether or not it is called from inside of a Rails application. You can see if we call it from outside of a Rails application here, it can't do a whole lot more besides create a new Rails app or an engine. So let's create a new application here called blog and then we can CD into that application. And now when we run the Rails command from inside of the application, you can see it has a completely different set of functionality. It has all of these various subcommands which perform different actions on that application. Now what this Rails command does is load this cli.rb file here. And one of the first things that this does is it looks for a script Rails command and it will load that. So this means if you run this inside of your Rails application, it's going to run the script Rails command specifically in that app and not execute the rest of the script. However, if it doesn't find it, if it's not in a Rails app, it's going to execute the rest of this and either create a new plugin or engine or create an application. And so this is under Rails commands application, and you can check that out under the commands directory here. What this will do is basically load up the generators and run the uh, app generator here. So, but if we run that command in our application, it's the same as calling script Rails here. So let's take a look at what that does. So inside of our app, let's open up that script directory and we have a single Rails command here. And notice it just does a few things. One it does is uh, record the application uh, config file path. It's not actually loading the application file here, just saving the path. And then it loads the config boot file and then it loads the Rails commands. And so because this is prefixed with Rails and it's inside of our Rail ties, but let's first take a look at our config boot file here and see what that does. So that's under the config directory, the boot file. And this just does a couple of things too. It loads up Ruby gems and then sets up bundler. Now the actual gems are not loaded in this case right here. It's just uh, setting up the load paths basically so they can be required later. All right, so now that we know what the boot config file does, the next thing it did there was load the Rails commands file. So that's under Rail ties here. Just open that up. And so this is kind of cool because right at the top here, it shows you the various aliases which you can pass in to run different commands through the Rails command. So the first thing this does is shift off the, uh, the command and then it expands the alias. And then we have this case statement here to uh, handle different behavior for different commands. And the one I want to focus on here is the server command here. So here's what this command does. It requires the server command file, which is under the commands directory here, server. And then it just creates a new server instance, uh, loads the application config file, and then it goes into the root of the application directory, and then it starts the server up. So let's check out that server file here. So you can see that the uh, Rails server class is defined here, and notice that it inherits from rack server. So that's kind of nice to know that a Rails server is just a simple uh, thin wrapper around Rack server. And if we scroll down to the interesting bits here, we have the start method, which is called, and this prints out some output that you're probably familiar with, and then it calls super. So this is going to call up to the Rack server and actually start up the Rack server. Now that expects a Rackup file, and so that this just defaults to config.rackup in the Rails application. And so this is kind of nice because a Rails application in Rails 3 is just a simple rack app. So if you take a look into any Rails 3 application, you will find there is a config rackup file inside of here. And what this does is loads up the config environment file, and then it tells Rack to run the specific Rails application. And Rack internally, whenever it receives a web request, it will call 
call on that object passed in and pass in any of the request arguments into it. And so our blog application here is a full Rack compatible application, and that's how it serves requests. So ultimately, this is how the server starts up and serves requests. But I did skip over the loading of the application itself. So let's dive into the environment config file, and I'll step you through the actual loading process. So that's under the config directory here, the environment file. And so this is very simple here. It just loads the application config file if it hasn't been loaded already, and then it calls initialize on our application. But let's go into the application config file and see how that works. And so this first loads the boot file if it hasn't been loaded already. In our case it has, we've already taken a look at it. It just sets up bundler, and then it requires Rails all. And this will basically load the entire Rails framework. And you can see exactly how that works by going into Rail Ties, check out the Rails all file here, and notice it just loads up each part of Rails and it just requires a rail tie file inside of that specific framework. Uh, I won't go into each specific framework here, but you can check out each rail tie to see exactly how that works. Okay, so back into the application config file here. After the Rails framework is fully loaded, it's going to include all of your various Ruby gems in the gem file using Bundler right here. And it does this with a call to bundler.require. And this changed a little bit in Rails 3.1 because you can see here, what this does is it only loads the assets group of gems if you're inside of the development or test environment. So this way, if you're using pre-compiled assets, it won't have to load the assets gems inside of the production environment. Now some comments are provided telling you how to change this behavior here if you want to. But let's move on to the interesting part here, which is creation of the blog application class. And so this is the class that is passed into our Rack server inside of the rack of files. So this in itself is a rack application. And notice that it inherits from Rails application. So let's take a look at how that works. Inside of the rail ties here, we have the rails application.rb file, which defines that application class here that it inherits from. And notice that this application inherits from Rails engine. So that means that every Rails application in itself is also a Rails engine, but it has some additional functionality and behavior defined in this class here. One such thing is that you cannot have more than one Rails application subclass as shown here in this inherited callback. So this bit of code right here in this method is going to be executed by Ruby when a given class inherits from this class, which is Rails application. So when this happens, what it's going to do is call base instance, which is going to make a new instance of our Rails application and set it to rails.application. So this means anywhere in our app, we can gain access to our Rails application by calling rails.application. And then it's going to add lib to the load path and then run a before configuration hook. Now the way this instance behavior works is kind of interesting because it turns it into a singleton and we can trace that functionality back through super here. So let's go into our super class, which is engine, and that's in here. And then we could just scroll past this documentation here, which by the way is very good. I highly recommend reading the engine documentation. And then this brings us to our engine class definition, which if you notice an engine inherits from a rail tie. And a rail tie is used all over in Ruby gems. Pretty much anything that wants to integrate into a rails application creates its own rail tie. And that has its own configuration options, which uh, an engine also supports. And notice that an engine also defines the inherited method, but it doesn't do much of anything interesting, it just cleans up some of the uh, backtrace here. So what we can do is look inside of the rail tie class, which is right here. And this class is also nicely documented, well worth reading. And here's the class definition. Notice it doesn't have any super classes, so this is the top of the inheritance chain, but it does include a module. If you check out the inherited method here, Whenever this is inherited, it includes the configurable module right here. And also notice that uh, this keeps track of which uh, classes subclass this so that it can use those later on. So let's check out that configurable module here. And this is where our rabbit trail ends. Here's where the instance method is defined that we ended up calling way up in our application class. This basically just creates a new instance of the class and caches that so that it returns that same instance every time this method is called. However, it also does something very interesting and that is define method missing. 
And so this means every single method that's called on this class, anything that's not defined, is going to be passed into the instance. So this works just like a singleton. Basically, any method called on that class will act as an instance method. And you can see, if you go back up to the application class here, that there are a lot of instance methods defined in this class, and these all can act as class methods by being called directly on the class. And oftentimes you will see these methods called on the blog application class itself, and they'll just delegate to the actual instance. And you can see an example of this by going back to the blog application instead of the application config file here. You will often see config called as a class method directly on our application like this to access the configuration. But if you take a look at the internals of the Rails application class, you can see that the config method is defined inside of here, but it's defined as an instance method, and so the class call will delegate to this instance call, and notice that uh, this returns a new application configuration. I'm not going to get into the configuration in this episode, but you may want to check out this configuration class to see how that works. Now one thing I do want to cover here though are initializers. And initializers are basically just little blocks of code that get run in a sequence. And this is where most of the uh, Rails initialization process for the application happens. And if you uh, scroll up here, you can see that there is an initialize bang method here, which basically runs all the initializers inside of that array. Now you may recall that this initialize bang method here is called from inside of the environment config file in our application. So now that we know when our initializers are executed, where are they defined? Well, most of them are defined inside of the engine class here. So if you scroll down a ways in this engine class, you can see that there are several calls to initializer. And if you've ever set up a Rails plugin or engine through a gem or something, you'll probably be familiar with this because this is how you get a bit of code to run at the beginning of a Rails initialization process. And so you can uh, see there's various initializers here. And there are some interesting things that happen here, such as loading the config environment file. So this, for example, will load the proper config environment file, depending on the current environment. And it will also, this one right here, loads each of the files in the config initializers directory. So this is where really the loading of your application happens. Now what about initializers defined outside of our application, such as inside of uh, RubyGems? Well, if you take a look up here, you can see that there is a method called initializers. And what this is going to do is take all of the rail ties, which are including all of the gems rail ties, and fetch all the initializers inside of those, and fetch the current initializers inside of this application, and then return all of those. So this is going to include and bundle up all the initializers together, everything outside of the application and inside, and then return those. So those are all that gets run. Well, that's it for this whirlwind tour on what exactly is happening behind the scenes as your Rails application is starting up. Now, if you want some related information on this topic, there are a couple of Rails guides I recommend you check out. One is on the Rails initialization process, which sort of walks you through some of the stuff I covered here. And there's also one on configuring Rails that I think is worth checking out because configuration ties in closely to initialization and it talks about when some of the, uh, the hooks get triggered and so on. Well, that's it for this episode on the Rails initialization process. Hope you found it useful.